Yes, hello again. I'm Anne Jung. I'm head of public relations at Medico International. And I'm very pleased to get to introduce to you Thomas Gebauer, our next speaker. He is a psychologist and he has spent 40 years with Medico International and the majority of the time he was the executive director. So for two years now he's been the spokesman for Medico International and for just a number of days now he's been retired. And in the next years he'll continue to volunteer for Medico as part of the curatorship efforts of the Medical Foundation. I want to um, introduce him in some more detail and the reason for that is that a year and a half ago when we started planning this conference we had planned a major party which was supposed to take place last night to say farewell to him and due to the COVID pandemic uh, this could not happen. It had to be postponed indefinitely but I think it would be worthwhile to take a moment to look back on uh, his work because it touches directly on what we are uh, aiming for at this conference here. Not everyone will know him, but from my point of view, it's a good thing to know him because uh, there are many things that uh, can, uh, can also be translated to the future. Now, Thomas was very courageous uh, in that 12 years ago he was crucial in planning and organizing the first conference here where for the first time we took a critical look at the aid discourse and that took place at a time when aid was generally considered something that was good that was right and it was very bold to dare and question one owns one's own work in that way so his boldness is uh, characteristic of him and that is a crucial um, aspect it is something that has become tangible in other moments as well. Another such example is the international campaign on the ban of landmines, which he had helped found against all odds. Uh, he was told not to do it, that it was too daring a move, that the opponents were too powerful. But for many years, he stuck to it with the result of landmines having been banned today. And at the same time, this is a descriptive of a space of, for critical thinking that has become possible and uh, tangible and which he has always defended even in a time where uh, M Margaret Thatcher's dogma there is no alternative seemed ubiquitous and omnipotent and where there seemed to be no space left for critical thinking and to uphold this dur during such a political phase also reveals uh, the core of political thinking we see here that we all ha should uh, strive for and that we need to defend for the next years, um, uh, Thomas will continue to organize the Space for Utopia here, and we do hope that this conference will also serve as a starting point for this utopian thinking to also go transnational and to open up this space in the same way that we've been opening up uh, during these last three days of our conference. There are just a few of us at this location now, the medical house, and this house, this space is to be upheld as a space of critical and for critical thinking, and it, this would never have happened without uh, Thomas's uh, bold approach of uh, embarking on this endeavor. I'm very much looking forward to his input. I look forward to it on behalf of uh, Medico's management and everyone else, and I look forward to continue to cooperating with him. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Anne. This really touches me. But now I have to get to my presentation because I don't have so much time. I would like to make a few remarks, but I'll save this for the time when we can meet and have a big party again. What we've heard over the last few days was that the crisis occurrence which has uh, 
happened over the last decades is very complex. But this is not only expressed in the destruction of human living worlds, but also in the failure of existing political processes of stopping this process of destruction. Millions of people are fleeing. There are civil war-like conditions everywhere. And uh, diseases without any changes being inside. Rather than urge for a change, we are looking, we are looking for the way out in going it alone nationally. The idea of withdrawing to small islands of prosperity may be attractive, but it's delusional. The causes of all of this are so much intertwined that dealing with crisis can no longer be done at a national level. With all the cultural differences we see worldwide, we can see the same production and consumption uh, conditions, the being forced to do wage work, to watch the same telenovelas, uh, have the same jeans, soft drinks, mobile phones, and use the same international uh, chartered accountants, law firms, and so on. So the world of which we hear that it's coming is has long been here, only it's not the expression of a harmoniously united world, but it is pervaded by power and deep social opposition, even brutal exclusion. With the market radical change, the world has become a uniform economic system without the emergence of the political and legal institutions which would secure the same participation to all. International agreements are regulating the free movement of capital and goods, but not the protection of the health of people, not an effective fight against famine and the right to uh, free movement of persons. In a remarkable way, globalization has remained incomplete. Not all have been integrated and many have still been completely excluded, as paradoxical as this sounds. The world society conditions today shaping them in political and legal terms. This is a great task and I would like to talk about this. Let's take a look at the existing approaches in international politics. For example, the UN which were founded under the impression of the Second World War in 1945. Never again were the conditions in the world to escalate in violence. The right to a dignified life to all should was to be realized after all. Today, we are sobered up the hopes of the UN are just uh, prowling in the ruins today, as my friend Jean Ziegler put it. Now, why have these hopes lost their place? The loss of, improve, of importance of the UN has grown along with the erosion of national states, like they lost their power to shape things by um, succumbing to the dicta dictate of a globally unleashed economy. The UN were never this representation of world society that they were thought to be. In the bodies of the UN, it's not the populations of the world meeting, but representatives of national states. Some are more powerful, some less powerful, and some may have a democratic structure, many with autocratic governments. And now there is this growing number of failed states. They all may make reference to the universal human rights, but in political everyday lives, they mainly enforce their own selfish interests and be just the maintenance of the power of those who are governing. How little human rights are counting can be seen in the UN Economic and Social Council and its importance, which is nearly marginal. Originally, it was intended to be as important but the, as the UN World Security Council. But whereas the Security Council was only to be active in emergencies, the idea of the Economic and Social Council was that it should be the foundation of peaceful living together. But if you ask a politician in 
the German Parliament today, many have never heard of the Economic and Social Council. You may have heard of the World Health Organization, but how it is working and why it's so weak today, not many know this. When the WHO was founded in 1946 as the central authority for international health work, but it's not really the world meeting there, but the representatives of the member countries, and they began in the 1980s to systematically limit the capability of the WHO to act, especially the powerful industrialized countries wanted to avoid the WHO taking its mission seriously and bringing about an effective north-south balance. In speeches held on Sundays, they would still make reference to the right to health, but in real life, the cementing of the production and consumption conditions was brought about, which are not condu conducive to health. In addition to the WHO, so-called public-private partnerships were established, which were to look after important global health issues like the supply of vaccines and medicines. What's special about these PPPs is that industry is not just involved indirectly at the lobby, but that they're openly at the negotiating table. But that's not all. Vastly unnoticed by the public, the General Secretariat of the UN in June 2019 sealed a strategic partnership with the World Economic Forum of Davos. And as they said, this was about implementing the Sustainable Development Goals of the 2015 UN Agenda. So it was not the World Social Forum which became the privileged partner of the UN with its representatives of social movements, of churches, unions, and local and transnational activists, but this elitist uh, group of representatives of industry and politics who, in order, even putting it diplomatically, are very much involved in the social ecologic devastation of the world. It's right that for implementing the SDGs, a lot of money is needed, but can we really save the world by the intensification of a way of production which has long met its limits, its planetary limits? This is what the UN agenda really calls for. It's not to be achieved by just distribution of the resources, but by economic growth which the countries should bring about. And how they should bring this about, they will be helped by a private club of leading captains of industry and lobbyists who are used to solving problems simply by management and the use of capital. To me, this looks as if we were asking the arsonists to make the uh, water for putting out the fire available. To me, a governance of a world domestic policy without a world government won't work like this. It was meant to be an alternative for neoliberal globalization. Their weaknesses are that the structural causes of poverty and dependence, the real power conditions, the opposition between classes and genders is overlooked. This can be seen in the motto, leave no one behind, which sounds likable. And this is also heading the SDG agenda. It suggests, ultimately, that people are not exploited, are not systematically discriminated against, but are just neglected. So it's not about fighting against existing power structures, but only about alleviating existing bad conditions by more efficient management, by a few millions of development aid, by resilience and other affirmative adaptation programs, for example, by learning entrepreneurial uh, practices called financial literacy. But a uh, crisis can never be handled with the same thinking that caused it as long as growth and competition-oriented deregulatory markets and technological progress paradigms are seen as the natural and unchangeable foundation of any um, co uh, socialization, uh, the globalization uh, or meeting the challenges of globalization will never be successful. 
the blindness towards the fundamental contradiction between what is seen as the common good of humanity and the corporatization of the world is the reason why the multi-stakeholder approaches which have been praised need to fail. It sound, doesn't sound so bad superficially. All involved in the political processes, the stakeholders, are to be involved in decision-making. Apart from governments, representatives from industry and civil society, this is a theory. In practice, it looks quite different, however. It's very unequal partners getting together. Powerful corporations, often represented by high-powered law firms, politicians who may have some liking for human rights, but will always uh, make reference to constraints following the economic dictate and influential philanthro capitalists with who, without whose donation nothing seems to be going anymore, apparently, and a few actors from civil society. But who really represents civil societies? Is it internationally positioned NGOs that have long been following their own agenda, or is it local grassroots initiatives and social movements? The multi-stakeholder meetings are getting together in a very uh, intransparent way, but they're still very self-confident in the way they're presenting themselves. But it's really um, investment companies that are acting worldwide, hedge funds, transnational food corporations, and so on. The na naive idea that a voluntary cooperation of very different actors could work. We could even say it's a cooperation of uh, the victims and the perpetrators, which is to lead to a world domestic policy. But this will not lead us to this objective. And this can also be seen by the shrinking scope of human rights activists all over the world. In fact, the conditions in the countries of the South are becoming more and more extreme. And so far, we are being protected by constitutional rights that have been fought for over the last two centuries. But there's no reason to assume that these constitutions coupled, coupled to national states will be of permanence. The world is at a junction today. It will either be under economic constraints and will be disintegrated further, or it will find the way towards a world society in solidarity in which human rights are given their societal framework. And this is exactly meant by Article 28 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which promises a social and international order to everyone in which human rights can be realized. It's high time for a radical turnaround in which an emancipatory understanding of society comes to bear. And this is what I would like to turn to now. The COVID crisis have, uh, has opened the, uh, the eyes to many, even hard-boiled liberals, neoliberals, who for decades had said that there's nothing like society had to admit that intact common wheels are needed for these tasks. All of a sudden, solidarity and common wheel seem to mean something again. But let's take a closer look. Although it was quite clear that the virus would only lose its terror if it's fought all over the world, the international commitment was quite modest, unlike in the prop prosperous countries where benefits were paid and other subsidies, people in the South were vastly left to themselves. The appeal for solidarity was nearly only aimed at the population of these countries. Solidarity between the young and the old, solidarity in the neighborhoods was asked for, and solidarity with people working at the checkout. It wasn't so much about the protection of refugees, and what was completely unheard was the proposal of the UN World Food Program to pay 
a basic income to the three billion people in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, so that they could also keep the recommended hygiene measures. This sounds like a lot of money, but just a debt service monitorium, a temporary one, would have been enough to fund a project like this. Why do we find global solidarity so hard? Why all this haggling about a few vaccination doses when production shortages become clear? Why this complaint about the British, who are supposed to be getting more? Why these nationalist resentments? Whereas the actual scandal really is that the WHO is to do with only 40 million doses for 4 billion of the poorest. The fight for these privileges shows how deeply entrenched the ideology of the capitalist life forms is in the minds of people. It's not solidarity, but competition, not universal right, but insisting on one's own right, which characterizes this ideology, which seems to be even underpinned by these social inequalities. The situation may be unfair, but there is no alternative we hear. And this will remain so as long as we're not beginning to put solidarity or to rethink solidarity across all borders. This is easily said, but there are a lot of questions. What does the solidarity world community really mean in specific terms? Where can the reconstruction of world society start? How can we deal with the precarious circumstance that these issues seem to be overtaxing for us, but we can't wait? How can we bring about awareness of people for the importance of a democratic and solidary world society? The reasons why this awareness is so low have many aspects. Let me mention a few of them, and I'm referring to the thoughts of the literary critic Georg Lukacs, who a hundred years ago already pointed out convincingly how capitalism took out people from their traditional frames of reference of, poly of religion, family, and class, and made them lonely. What could have given them new uh, ties and dignity could not be brought about because it was in contradiction to the logic of capitalism. This logic doesn't focus on the common good, but on competition, not on social ties, but on as flexible people as possible. In this context, Lukacs spoke of a transcendental homelessness. And I find this description is very apt. It seems to be exactly what is making things so difficult for us today. It shows the neoliberal dogma. There is no thing such as society. Running down everything social, in this way, neoliberalism has made people completely homeless in a figurative meaning of the world, but for many also in a literal meaning of the world. The insecurity that comes with this loss is enormous. and. It only has grown with the development of globalization so far. I'm not surprised if people who are only imparted these high-flying narcissist ideals, but who have hardly any influence on organizing their living world, if they feel uneasy about globalization, this unease, which uh, calls for compensation, which is often distorted, like in the renaissance of nationalist movements and the growth of racist attitudes. Of course, we need to fight against this, but we also need to make sure that these distortions do not find more support. People believe in what they feel, as Rita Segato said yesterday. If we take this statement seriously, then today, we must speak about the idea of something which is not authoritarian, which is an emancipatory home for all, as a global society in which individual freedom rights and social needs are guaranteed. Society is not a negligible variable. It's not a social system consisting of norms and values reproducing themselves, as system theory says. 
Society is a social practice which is shaped by people and which will always be fought for. Societies do not exist beyond the active participation of people. And so the human rights will only count if we guarantee them for each other mutually and also underpin them in material terms by social balancing. Only where the democratically institutions which are democratically controlled and created in a democratic way, and if they bring about an infrastructure which is accessible to all, only there can people really realize their rights to education and health, and only where sanctions exist can any violations of these rights be limited effectively. With this claim, we see the situation of the world society today. It's uh, shaming to see how much political energy was invested in serving only one aspect of society, economy, whereas the other aspects like law and politics were hardly taken into account and are lagging behind in a fatal way today. And this is what it needs to be about today. If we want to fight against this renaissance of nationalist thinking and acting effectively, we need an answer to this. How a non-authoritarian and emancipatory society across all borders could look like. Let's keep this in mind. This is not about the creation of a world state. It's not about installing a world government, but it's about designing the existing world society in such a way that the unleashed forces of globalization can be brought under control again. Moral protest is important, but this will not be enough in order to mobilize people. We need an attractive idea of what a different world could look like, which enables freed up life. And we need a strategy how to achieve this. Both is by no means given. There are some cosmopolitan ideas which are not new and they are still controversial. Professor Mbembe spoke of the need for complementing cosmopolitan thinking with a post-European uh, aspect. If we take a closer look, it's not necessarily the human rights which need to be criticized, but their abuse. After all, the powerful global north doesn't care about human rights so much when they want to enforce their own interests, but they will feel them happily if the existing world order is to be stabilized by military operations. This abuse will continue as long as politics is not tied to law across all borders. The accusation that cosmopolitan thinking was a continuation of colonialism with different means does apply when the existing production and ruling conditions remain constant. We don't want this. We want cosmopolitan thinking along the lines of a shared ethics of the world, which does not impose a societal model that doesn't allow any diversity anymore. When we look at the horror vision of an authoritarian world government, as we have often been shown by Hollywood, if we want to avoid this, then we need to create many self-determined living worlds, which have a framework supported by democracy and solidarity. And this is the essence of Article 28, which I mentioned, Article 28, of the Declaration of Human Rights. Today, it means nothing else but balancing the rights to freedom to the rights to social security. Let me conclude. Radical changes will not be successful overnight, but what keeps us from beginning even today? The genie of globalization has long left its bottle. The hope of being able to catch it again by national walling in is observed. It's not the approximation of the world, but the precarious, massive social distortions in which the world society 
are today, but we also discovered the absolute opposite. We recognize modes of living which are not reified. We discover projects and political practices which do not only claim alternatives but are living them. We see people who refuse to be uh, corporatized in this way, who are running their cooperative farms or companies, who work for culture centers, who organize meetings with refugees, who are protesting against arms trading and fight for the rights of refugees or, or LG, LGBT rights. All of this is right and important, but this commitment suffers at times by not being related to each other. It's not part of a shared urging for change. In the last years, I have often met with uh, local initiatives and projects which all existed next to each other without knowing of each other. The strategy that some environmental activists have used successfully, global thinking, lo local acting, is still waiting to be expanded to the social issue. Of course, there are general values like democracy, social justice, and free movement, but how to specify them in the transnational space, space is not yet clear. When we urge democratic rights, this is not just defending what has been achieved in one's own country, but it has to be expanded into the global. But what does global democracy really mean? It becomes clear when we think of this that democracy has a utopian character. It describes a utopian idea which must not be postponed into a distant future, but which need to be tackled today. For example, by global assemblies of actors in civil society, consulting about the foundations of a world constitution, a constitution which uh, links back to the major revolutions, the American and the French revolutions, and expanding this to a global level. This seems to be a precondition. So that we come to a shared ethic which is based on law. And this must not be remain a utopian idea. Even beyond formal government structures, this can be successful. The open source community, for example, has shown this with its rules that are applied across all borders. And, and the Zurich city card that has been introduced in Zurich shows the same direction many have shown, have fought in Zurich, that everybody living in Zurich gets an official uh, passport independent of their status and of their background. Now, even people without official paperwork have an ID. They can turn to public authorities, get library cards, and can use other services. The right to having rights is no longer tied to belonging to the national state in Zurich. I think it's a great step towards a world society in solidarity. But we could also look at traditional international law for controlling, for example, the enforcement of the diversity uh, compact and the ban on landmines have shown what needs to be taken into account. They wouldn't have happened without public pressure. It's always been transnational movements that unfolded the force, which made national state governments give in. The successful cooperation of global and local activity, we need to make reference to this and connect to it, for example, with the objective of obtaining a binding agreement which commits transnational corporations to keeping human rights or having a broad alliance of civil society with the objective of installing an international human rights court so that uh, action could be taken against foreign powers, for example, 
worldwide corporations. But there's another thing to be learned about international agreements. They're worth little if there are no sanctions and the means for their implementation. And there's no lack of resources in order to make the world more socially just. The world is simply swimming in money, only it's not in the places where it's needed. It would long be possible to introduce a universal basic income or an international health fund, a kind of general insurance, which would be open to all peoples all over the world so that they would have access to appropriate health services. A health fund like this, by the way, would not require any inflated administrative body. It would just take a contractual basis which would oblige the more prosperous countries for standing in for the health needs as we have this, for example, in the balancing of funds among the German states. This would uh, guarantee mutual solidarity. And in Germany, for example, states that used to be net receivers have been become payers today. We need a strategic concept for this and a program which is comprehensive and does not limit itself to commonplace. Then the power can be unfolded, which is needed to fight against the existing structural violence. It makes me more and more optimistic when I look at the worldwide outcry against weapons and racism. Racism, it's growing across the world, wanting new and democratic multilateralism. So there is mobilization and it's not lacking these new mo movements. And this may be the way out of this crisis, agreeing on a globalization in solidarity coming from the bottom. What speaks against the idea of the UN Economic and Social Council putting this on its feet again, so that, for example, people would get together everywhere and would urge the democratization of economic conditions. What speaks against health forums that achieve what the bureaucratic economic structures can no longer do, which is giving a voice to those whose health this is about. We need this counterforce, and this in a dual meaning. A powerful and self-confident public is needed in order to enforce democratic processes, but it's also needed for watching that the institutions that have been created do not run out of control. When we look at this from an emancipatory perspective and speak of good governance, this can only be in the context of establishing, enabling structures which allow people everywhere in the world to design their living worlds in self-determination. And this doesn't mean a uniformity of all life in a disciplining way, but making diversity possible. Society is what we have in common as people, and it is the force which opens up the way to a freed life to everyone. It's about the creation of this common ground on which the meeting of free people can be successful. Thank you very much.